нас лекция заявлена на английском языке по просьбе организаторов, поэтому я сейчас переключусь на свой немного не, не, несовершенный английский. So, sorry about that, but it's uh, one of the prerequisites. But I uh, also invite you for, for before the other event. I will be here again on December the 8th. That will be Russian language discussion about my recent book, uh, my recent book about the use of history, use of misuse of history for political purposes. The book titled, uh, the book itself is in Russian, uh, with, with the title Bitva za prošlaya, как политика меняет историю. But today we are speaking, we are talking about my next book. Actually, uh, the essence of our today lecture will be uh, the, my attempt to explain uh, why American foreign policy, uh, why uh, the American discussion about American discourse of the foreign policy uh, is so different from what, what we know uh, in the European context and the post-Soviet context. And that is actually the essence of my next book, which I hope will be published early next year in the same uh, publisher, uh, Alpina, Alpina Publisher, so it may be in February uh, of 2024. So that is, uh, and today is a uh, right day, correct day to speak, to talk about the American foreign policy because today is exactly 60 years, uh, 60 years ago, uh, this day, uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. So today is the uh, 60th anniversary of one of the uh, most uh, famous political assassination in the world history. And we, uh, we can speak about, uh, about the United States and about, uh, and why uh, John Kennedy, John F. Kennedy was so popular, so popular not only in the United States and maybe more not in the United States, but worldwide. And uh, I would say, I would dare to say that uh, Kennedy's popularity was uh, also, can be compared to Barack Obama. Uh, uh, especially the first years of Barack Obama presidency, he was also very popular uh, in the world and maybe more popular than inside his own country. And that is also the phenomena which I, I will try to, if not explain, but to suggest some hypothesis why it's so. So we all know that the United States is the most, uh, well, the richest, the most powerful uh, militarily and economically. Uh, uh, power in the contemporary world and its uh, influence on the world affairs are huge. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, now is, there is a simple explanation of that. We can say that, okay, the United States is indeed the most powerful because it has the biggest, largest military, because it spends, uh, because it also has the strongest economy and still the economy which is stronger than uh, well, any, any other, including China, rising China, and all of that uh, economies in the world. So it's easy to explain. But if you look back, if you look uh, like a century ago to the period of century ago, we can see that even then uh, the United States were uh, very influential. While uh, it was not a member of the uh, I would say European community of nations because the United States were still isolated on the distant uh, continent at least before until the first world war until the Versailles treaties and League of Nations was established the United States were a politically uh, country well beyond the traditional European alliances and still it was already popular and I, I would say that uh, to understand the American uh, role in the world and American foreign relations, we should uh, approach it not from the, uh, the theoretical point of view developed by so-called realist uh, interpretations. You know, political realism is a uh, like framework of, of uh, political analysis which uh, refers to resources, military strengths, economic resources. But uh, we should uh, turn rather to uh, constructivist uh, approach. And I will, what I am going to, to, to tell you, to, to, well, to develop in today's lecture, is a constructivist approach to what America, uh, what America is and what America was in its history. And I would say that we can uh, speak about two major uh, problems. 
uh, how America is viewed worldwide and how the rest of the us, the rest of the uh, globe uh, look at America and what we see there. And the second, uh, how America uh, look at the other world and why America needs the other world, the, the other countries, the, uh, the outs, uh, outside world for the, the domestic development. So let's start with how we saw America from the very beginning. Let's start from the 18th century when the United States were still colonies or British colonies and they emerged as an independent state uh, during the American War for Independence. And uh, already then, uh, the United States was very important. Well, of course, uh, not politically important, but important uh, philosophically, I would say, uh, in the European political thought. Why? Because America uh, was uh, imagined in, the, in Europe as a country uh, which represents the, uh, oh, as an embodiment of uh, enlightenment ideas. You know, the 18th century was a, a century when uh, French and Scottish uh, philosophers developed these ideas about the division of power, division of power about the uh, popular representation. Uh, and well, other political ideas uh, of new, new type of republic. Uh, but all of that uh, can, uh, remained or continued to be just a philosophical ideas. It was just uh, uh, books and articles and pamphlets, but not a real life. But Europeans uh, started to uh, think about uh, America, even not the United States of America, but American colonies, as a, a country, uh, as a type of utopia, the country which uh, represents somehow this uh, utopian European ideas. And immediately when the United States emerged as an independent country, uh, the European, uh, well, European thinkers uh, ascribed to America uh, these ideas. That was very popular, became very popular to, to speak about the United States as a country where European political ideas, uh, European enlightenment ideas are, uh, well, ha ha uh, have been, uh, well, made, made the real life. Uh, so, uh, and uh, one of the consequences of, of such an approach was that for at least century and a half. Again, until, uh, until Woodrow Wilson, until the First World War, uh, America continued to play the role of utopian land. Uh, Americans were very, well, very distant. The United States did not interfere and could not interfere into European uh, political, uh, well, political life. And of course, it, it was not able to interfere militarily in, in, in what is, was going on in Europe. But uh, European thinkers of different uh, ideological background, of different uh, set, of free, uh, set of ideas, uh, continue to use America as a, uh, describe, describe the United States as a country where their ideas, their particular ideas uh, uh, became true. So anarchists like, you know, like Bakunin, uh, when they wanted to uh, somehow uh, substantiate they claim that the country without strong central government can work, they say, okay, we have the United States, a country where is all, there is no strong central uh, power, and it's a flourishing uh, and economically developed, uh, developed nation. So for anarchist, America was an example of anarchist country. But for socialists, at the, no, no, at the same time, or maybe a decade later, for, the, for socialist thinkers, America was an uh, example of country of socialist ideas because, well, uh, the United States was a country of engineers and they have plans. Engineers built everything according to their plans. So for socialists, uh, for the socialist uh, thinkers, America was a uh, proof that socialist ideas works. And so that continued. Uh, every uh, political thinker in Europe ascribed, Amer ascribed to America, ascribed to the United States their own, uh, their own dreams, their own, their own ideas of, of uh, right uh, and wrong. Uh, later, when uh, the United States grew up and became economically strong, economically, economic stronghold, when American example became attractive uh, for uh, for 
for European uh, rulers, uh, they uh, started to, uh, to use American example as a pretext for, for their domestic reforms. I would say that, uh, and even then, they ascribed, they found each political uh, group in, in, in Europe, in European countries, uh, found something special in the American uh, case. Well, uh, those who fought for independence, like you know, the Hungarians inside the Austrian Empire, they uh, saw that the United States was an example of self, uh, of, home, of home rule, of, uh, of the national uh, independence, of, you know, the uh, successful, uh, successful case of, of national independence. And that was uh, uh, important for any uh, ethnic national group in Europe who fought for their independence. They say, well, the American examples, first of all, the uh, example of national independence. They get rid of British rule and we can do, we, we can, we Hungarians can get rid of uh, Austrian rule or, you know, we Irish can be uh, free ourselves from British rule. So that was a very, uh, a very attractive uh, example for, 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 for these groups. Uh, but uh, later, for, for revolutionaries, for democratic reformists, America, of course, was an uh, example of republic or of democracy. It's not the same, but well, like Decembrist in Russia. I don't know if you know that. Uh, uh, I don't know if you, if you heard about that, but uh, Russian Decembrists, those noble revolutionaries of, 19, of, of 1825, they copied and translated American constitution into Russian. They used the American example in their planning, political plans for, for Russia. But uh, later in the 20th century, when America indeed became the strong, uh, economically uh, probably the strongest, uh, the strongest country in the world, uh, People of very different uh, political uh, political beliefs uh, also turned to American example, and we know that in 1920s, uh, in the Soviet Russia, Bolsheviks, those who rule uh, Russia and you know on this uh, steered uh, Russian development uh, development to to socialist ideas, they uh, claimed that the United States is a country which was close to socialism. You probably heard the idea, uh, the slogan, the idea, formula, that socialism uh, is, a so is a Soviet power plus, okay, you probably heard electricity, electrification, which was like uh, pretty widespread in the Russian Soviet textbooks. But it also, uh, they also used uh, Trotsky or Bukharin even, used the, uh, the other variant. Uh, socialism is a Soviet power plus uh, Americanization or Fordization also. They used Americanization as a, a synonymous for economic efficiency. And the United States demonstrated the highest economic efficiency. So uh, if socialism was a Soviet power plus economic efficiency, that means that there are two countries in the world which were close to socialism. Soviet, Russia, because there is already Soviet power and uh, we just needed uh, better economic efficiency. And the United States, they already have the highest economic efficiency and what uh, they needed, they needed just Soviet power to be established and that is so that was, uh, and during industrialization, during this campaign of uh, rapid uh, construction of uh, industrial enterprises, uh, Soviet Russia and Soviet Union already uh, relied mostly on the American example, American design, American engineers. And all of this huge construction site of the first five-year plan, like uh, Stalingrad tractor plant, uh, Magnitogorsk metallurgical combine, um, well, Dnipro-Gas, Dnipro-Electric Station, all of them were built on American design by American engineers. Like, that was a time when, during uh, 1930, several thousand of American engineers and workers, uh, high-skilled workers, worked in, in the Soviet Russia. So that was a big influ uh, influence of, 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 of America in, in Russia. But at the same time, approximately the same, well, just a few years uh, earlier, uh, the German... Uh, young, well, not young already, but a German uh, aspiring politician named Adolf Hitler uh, published his own book, uh, uh, Mein Kampf, yeah. and he also, he also referred there to American example. He was saying, you know why America is so, so rich? 
because America had a big Lebensraum. America had a huge, uh, vast space in the West, which helped them to develop the huge economy. So we had, Germans needed the same, uh, the same Lebensraum. We also need the vast uh, territory to be con conquered and, uh, and used for, 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 for economic development. So American example was used by German Nazis also. And of course, America was a good example because in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s, it was still very racist country. So the hierarchy of races was also something which Hitler uh, adored. But well, he developed that to, uh, we know to what. <laughs> but, but, uh, but America was also example for, for him in the early stage of development of, uh, of his ideology. So America was, uh, in any political, this is the same uh, idea that uh, any European politicians from Nazis to socialists, from liberal uh, reformists to, uh, to state uh, governmental uh, reformists, uh, they used American example as a proof that their reforms are you know, well, going to the right direction that they can develop their own country by using uh, the American, uh, American way, American example. And that continued until uh, probably the Second World War, uh, until the end of the Second World War, when the uh, situation changed. And it changed because American, America came, the United States of America came to Europe and to, well, and to Asia, to Japan, to, to other countries. Uh, uh, as a regions of, of the world, uh, not only as an example, as a distant country, which you, you can imagine and you can dream about, but as a real country with their military, with the economy, with later with McDonald's and all of the of Hollywood movies. So America uh, suddenly uh, became present in, in the countries where they, it was not as a real country. And that uh, led some, uh, well, to the development, emergence of, uh, say, uh, of first anti-American groups, anti-American ideologies in European countries and in, in some other countries. Because, well, this was a kind of anti-Americanism of acquaintance. Uh, some, some people became disillusioned, you know. Well, we dreamed that America was so, so free, so good, and so, you know, like, uh, very, you know, sub, sublime uh, country, and that uh, we found that it was not. It was not as good as we dreamed about it. It was probably good. It's it's free, but not as free as we we we, we, we thought it. You know, it's uh, liberal, but uh, well, not the same way we dreamed about. It's uh, well. So it was a lot of disillusionment and uh, disappointment, even it's, uh, among some of, of political forces in Europe. And what is interesting in Western Europe, this disillusionment came soon after 1945. In Eastern Europe, it was postponed till the 1990s, when you know when the uh, Eastern Europe was opened for America and also for for Russia as well. You know that was. Uh, much of the anti-American uh, feelings and anti-American propaganda, of course, of the current uh, Russian regime, based on this disillusionment, because some of the Russian, you know, even like liberal intelligentsia, also feel disillusioned. Well, America is not the same country. Well, we we dreamed about during cold, during Cold War, during the Iron Curtain was used. Well, it's not as free as we we, we thought. It's not as supportive as we thought it would be. And that was a, uh, one, one of the changes of the, the, of the attitudes of, uh, to, towards America. But of course, I, I would not uh, like to over, uh, overstretch this disillusionment. Uh, the United States continued to be a, a model for, for, for many uh, political forces and for many ones, especially for those who dream about freedom in the authoritarian countries. Uh, but. Uh, there is also another problem. Uh, until the end of the Second World War, the United States was uh, the biggest and one of the very few examples of uh, liberal democracies. Well, the countries in Europe, well, there were also some other liberal democracies before the Second World War. Like, okay, we can say, we can speak about France, about England, but not much. Most of Europe were still authoritarian before, until, the first, uh, until the Second World War end. But after that, during the late 40s and the 50s and the 60s, uh, most of Europe became liberal democracies of different kind, but liberal democracies. So the American example 
is no more the monopoly, the not, not the only one which can be used by, by the dreamers in the other kind of authoritarian countries. You can make a choice. You, well, we don't like American example. We prefer Sweden, for example, you know, or some other example. We, we prefer Italian variant of democracy. So we have choices. And uh, that also uh, decreases the uh, role of American model, American example in, in the, the sound changes somehow yeah, uh, so, uh, in, in, in the contemporary world. So let's turn uh, back uh, and turn to American uh, domestic, domestic affairs and the domestic uh, visions and how the Americans uh, formulate their place in the world. I would start with a major constructivist idea that any, can't, any uh, group, uh, any nation, any ethnic group, or even you know, team of uh, you know, soccer fans uh, need to establish their identity. You know, this like basic, basic idea of any constructivism, identity, who we are, what we are, what makes us the, uh, well, the same, the, what, what uh, makes us belonging to the same group, what makes us all you know, Russians, Armenians, uh, Americans. And uh, there are uh, usually just two ways to, to respond, just two ways to base your identity on. One is history. We are all descendants of some heroic people or victims or whatever, but we, we are descendants of great grandfathers who, you know, who, who suffered or who won the victories, whatever, made a huge, uh, you know, huge construction or great culture, whatever. But this is, uh, the past is one uh, possible base so to build your identity. And the second is uh, border, is a comparison. We are not our neighbors. We are not those guys who live uh, around, the, around the corner, on the other side of the mountain, on the other side of the river. So we are not them. And that is uh, another very important uh, way to, to build our identity. You know, when I uh, travel to Canada and I ask Canadians, tell me please, what does it mean to be Canadian? And the most frequent answer was, we Canadians, we are not Americans. You know, to, to define themselves as Canadians, they needed to say, we are not Americans. And that's also when I when I uh, give this example to to my students some uh, time ago, and there was Belarusian students who say, "Okay, we are Belarusians do the same." This most frequent answer in Belarus was, "We are not Russians." You know, if you ask being asked, "What does it mean to be Belarusian?" We are not Russians, and that's uh, how it works. I mean, we need somebody who to to, to distinguish ourselves from, and that is a, the second way to, to to build your identity. So let's turn back to America. History doesn't work, it didn't work, especially in the very first time. When Americans uh, uh, announced it, uh, claimed their independence, they claimed independence from England, uh, from Great Britain, United Kingdom, which were the same English people. I mean, the people who uh, claimed their independence were English people with the same history, were just resettled across the Atlantic Ocean, and they shared the same history with, with English. It was very hard to build a common uh, identity. Moreover, uh, later, uh, the United States became the nation of immigrants. And uh, there is also you know, common history does not work the same way it works in Europe. If you, well, just imagine contemporary Americans and you can say, okay, your heroic, uh, this, uh, heroic an ancestors, uh, founding fathers or uh, father pil pilgrims. And, you know, majority of Americans would say that, you know, my, my grandfather arrived to America in the 20th century. We have nothing to do with heroic uh, founding fathers or uh, father, pilgrim fathers. Even the American Civil War, the core historical event in American history, well, uh, not many, well, many Americans would not uh, trace their origin from that time. Okay, very big, uh, uh, big portion of American population arrived to America later. And they arrived from different, uh, from different uh, directions, you know. There's not also, not only uh, English people, not only Irish people, not only European people anymore. It's much more people from Africa, from Asia, from, you know, from, from other uh, sides, from uh, Pacific Ocean. So there is no more uh, people who can say that we have the common history. So historical base just do not work 
at least uh, work to the much lesser extent that it can work in Russia. So it, it, at the same time, it means that American politicians and American journalists, those who build this identity, uh, who develop and who use identity as a legitimation for the political uh, actions, and politicians always use uh, this identity to, as, to legitimate what they are doing, uh, the second way to compare themselves with somebody plays much more important role than for the most of the rest of the uh, of the rest of the humankind, and that means that Americans uh, and uh, at the same time America is uh, domestically from the very beginning it's very split. Well, the first thirteen colonies were very different. You know, the people who traveled to found the first colonies. You know, uh, was a very you know they founded colonies on very different uh, bases, like from Puritan, very religious northern colonies in the Massachusetts Bay, to very commercial uh, middle uh, middle colonies like New York, and to very uh, agricultural colonies like Virginia. And they were different economically. They were they were very different ideologically. That was very just very different people. And they hated each other at some moments. And then they found uh, the, something common to, to, to create the common United, Nation, uh, United, sorry, United States, United States of America. And they created it by uh, juxtaposing themselves to, to Europe, juxtaposing first of all to London, to England, and then to, to, to Europe as a whole. And then continue, you know, that uh, Protestant Americans and Catholic Americans, white Americans and black Americans, uh, well, uh, Americans from the north and Americans from the south during the American Civil War. So it was a lot of uh, very deep splits in American society for the most uh, of, of its history. And each time American uh, domestic uh, splits, domestic uh, tensions between different parts of the population rose to, well, to dangerous extent, we can see how American foreign policy activated. You know, the activ uh, activization of American foreign policy very often uh, was, a cons uh, was a sequence, consequence of, of domestic splits. You know, I, I will, I'll tell you some, well, just one uh, historical anecdote. Uh, well, it's, it's a real, real story about what happened on the 1st of April of, 19, uh, of 1861. Just imagine, uh, 1861, uh, well, uh, Abraham Lincoln, just one month in the White House. He became president. He was elected in November of 1860. In uh, first of second of March of uh, 1861, he became president, really. Uh, between the, his election and his actually, uh, his um, uh, becoming president, part of the southern states announced its secession. So, uh, and, uh, April 1st is just two weeks before the first, before the first shots of the civil war started. So it's everything already uh, ready for, for civil war. And uh, at, the, at that day, uh, Secretary of State uh, William, Hover, uh, William uh, Seward, Secretary of State of, uh, of, of uh, Lincoln administration, uh, wrote a memorandum or memo to Lincoln. So it's in the history as a... Uh, April Fool's Day memorandum, it's like that, 1st of April. And the memorandum was, uh, he was just teaching Lincoln, you know, the country is uh, uh, splitting apart. The country is on the uh, verge of the huge catastrophe. And you're doing nothing. You're already months in the White House and you did nothing. And then he uh, suggested, what, what suggested the Secretary of State uh, to Lincoln to prevent the civil war? We need immediately start a war against Great Britain, France, Russian or Spanish Empire. And that will save us from the civil war. <laughs> Lincoln did not follow that as advice and the civil war emerged. But uh, the, very, you know, the idea uh, or the way of thinking of American, top American politicians was very clear. You know, the only thing which can save us from the domestic split is a foreign threat or foreign, foreign war. And we can uh, now like, take another example. Uh, a century later, in the 1960s, the period of the civil rights movements, you know, that was also very, well, it was not a civil war, but it was very uh, hot period for American domestic politics. And, you know, that was a time when 
uh, when uh, southerner uh, racist or southerner uh, southern politicians fought against the civil rights for uh, African Americans. And that was a, a period when uh, American presidents, first uh, Dwight Eisenhower and then uh, John Kennedy, uh, ordered American military, the federal, uh, federal military, to take over some of the southern cities just to ensure that African American children would go to school. Because local police was the same white racist people who did not want that uh, black children uh, attend the same school as their white uh, uh, white children. So that was like military use use of military just to, to ensure the civil rights movement. And that was a time when uh, in 1964, uh, 1963 was so called hot uh, hot summer when uh, students from the north, white students from the north, uh, participated in some so-called rights of freedom. And they uh, took buses to go to the south and, and tried to ensure uh, the segregation of bus stations, of uh, public places, restaurants, you know, that was. Uh, and some of them were just killed. You know, the thousand people uh, uh, resisted to, to this interference. So that was a very hot, hot moment. And you know that Martin Luther King was, King was already killed, assassinated at that time. And by the way, John, John Kennedy was assassinated. You know. And so that's a country you can imagine if you are being in America at that time, you can see that uh, country around you are also moving somewhere to, to hot you know, domestic war, if not civil war, but to, to very, to very uh, uh, to very big um, commotion. And so in July of 1964, finally the Congress of the United States voted for the Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Act the, the major legislation which uh, gave African Americans uh, well, uh, right to attend any public spaces. To, uh, and just two weeks after that resolution, the same Congress vote for another resolution. And that was resolution, so-called Tankin resolution, which gave President Johnson, but the, by that time President Johnson, a right to use military force in Vietnam. And that, uh, you know, uh, the start of Vietnam War, actually the American big involvement in the Vietnam started just two weeks after the civil rights legislation. And there are books now, which is now getting back to that ideas, there are American monographs uh, saying that the Viet that was Vietnam War which just uh, sucked the air from the civil rights movement. The African Americans supported Vietnam War in the first, uh, first years. Well, later, when that was a start rise of anti-Vietnam War protest, they changed, well, the majority changed their mind. But from the very beginning, African Americans wanted to be the part of the big American nation. We just get these rights on the Civil Rights Act. And we are the same nation that white Americans. And we are uh, together fought against communists there in Vietnam. So that was a uh, start of Vietnam War was also the uh, beginning of the end, not immediate end, but beginning of the end of the civil rights movement. And that was also how the foreign policy influenced the domestic development and how the activization of foreign policy, the start of the actually major war for America, that was one of the major wars, actually uh, helped American uh, government to suppress the domestic uh, split, domestic tension. So it worked like that many times, and that is uh, one of the ways uh, American uh, well, American poli po 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 policy, American politics works, uh, and uh, we we can also uh, find we can also look at the end of the 90, uh, end of the last century, end, uh, end of the eighties when the Cold War ended. You know, uh, in nineteen eighty nine or maybe in nineteen ninety one when the Soviet Union collapsed, the uh, Cold War ended. And there is no more the big threat from abroad which can be used for domestic purposes in the United States. And that was actually the major challenge to American domestic politics. It was a major challenge and you know it was not only, uh, it's, uh, not only politicians found it or maybe journalists. Uh, that's a good quotation from John Updike, you know, a famous American writer one of his 
in, in one of his new novels about rabbit, you know, that's one of the, I guess, fourth or fifth novel about rabbit, which was uh, written in the 1990s. Uh, his, his main character uh, says, and what's the point to be an American if the Cold War ended? What's the point to be an American? You know, that to be Amer uh, the Cold War was a kind of an uh, external uh, frame which helped Americans to feel, uh, to feel the national uh, destiny or to feel uh, its role in the world. And that if there is no Cold War anymore, if there is no big other, you know, constitutive other outside, what does it mean to be American? What, what, what makes us uh, the special nation? And what, does, and, uh, what we saw later, in the, already in this century, the new rise of the domestic split in American society. And these domestic splits with, with BLM, which is the most vis visible, but not only BLM. The domestic splits, uh, some, uh, well, some, I would say scholars, not everybody, but some scholars ascribe to the same problem, that uh, with the uh, extinguishing of the foreign uh, other, of the foreign threat, uh, there is no more way to, uh, to keep domestic integrity. And that is, uh, well, if you look into, this is very schematic, of course, I, I was saying, what I, what I was saying, but uh, we can say that uh, from, if, if we take this, uh, this uh, approach to, to American politics, we can, uh, we can probably um, forecast, you know, make a forecast that uh, domestic, uh, well, sometimes, you know, sometimes you can, uh, you can uh, listen, you can hear from, from a political analysts, especially in Russia, saying, okay, maybe if America will get more troubles inside, they will not be interested in like foreign, uh, foreign policies, they will turn back, backward, they will turn to domestic uh, problems. But uh, if we take this, exp this explanation, this uh, uh, way of thinking about American policy, we can, uh, we can guess that vice versa, if America will uh, face another domestic splits, the foreign policy will be more active. The domestic splits lead to increase of, uh, well, uh, in an attempt to, uh, to find the foreign threat, to find somebody to, to fight for. And that, means, of course, uh, what happened in the last, at least in the last two years or maybe more, uh, Russia emerged again as a, uh, as a threat. And, that, and if you see how American political elite and political discourse reacted, it was like some people felt like almost happy. Well, not happy, of course, but it was like, okay, finally we found somebody. We found the same old uh, enemy. We can, uh, we can again present ourselves as a, as a severe for, for the rest of the, uh, of the humankind and also to, to explain to our own Americans what we are for. <laughs> what does it mean to be American after the Cold War? We are still the... Uh, the major, uh, the major force in de defending liberty and democracy and uh, uh, worldwide. And that is how it works. And that is, but if you look back on the previous decades, like in the 90s and the early uh, 2000s, we can see how American politicians we were looking for some, some, something. You know, Islamic terrorism, 9-11, uh, was a uh, war on terror, if you remember this, uh, uh, this phrase by George Bush. George W. Bush, uh, well, that was all the attempts to find the significant other from the capital O. Uh, China emerged, of course, as a significant other. China would be considered uh, some, some new country to replace the Soviet Union as a major foreign threat. But uh, again, well, uh, contemporary Russia re-emerged, uh, and uh, contemporary Russia took the same uh, position or well, attempted to took the same position as a, uh, as a major uh, opposite pole to, to, to what America was fighting for. And it makes uh, uh, American uh, policy to get back on rails after the period of, uh, of uncertainty. So that is uh, mostly the, 
the scheme, and uh, I think that we can discuss later, and if you have questions and uh, comments, I will be glad to, to respond to your, uh, what? Is it too, too, well, I can, well, I, or I can talk more, if it's here. Yeah. What do you prefer? If you have any questions or comments, I, uh, we, we can turn, or I can continue for, for a while. Continue? Okay, so let's, uh, uh, for many years, for many, well, for, for, many, for many decades, Russia was a major significant other, or some uh, people say cons constitutive other. So the biggest other to uh, Americans, compare themsel uh, Americans compare themselves with. Why Russia? Well, of course, the first uh, other for American colonies was England. It's, it's easy, it's understandable. Uh, later, uh, American politicians started uh, early in the 19th century, they started to, uh, to describe themselves as an opposition to Europe. And you know, just in, in two weeks, we can, we can celebrate, okay, those who celebrate or at least commemorate the 200th anniversary of Monroe Doctrine. You know, December 2nd of uh, 1823 was a uh, day when President Monroe uh, uh, pronounced his, uh, delivered his uh, address to the Congress where he included this proposition which we know as the Monroe Doctrine. And doctrine, Monroe Doctrine was, the idea was that was, uh, there were three principles. That the Europeans should not interfere into American affairs. I mean, American meaning all America, South and North. That uh, the uh, Europeans should not acquire new colonies in the uh, American continent. And then uh, European countries should not transfer their existing colonies to another European country. So that was three principles that Americans uh, announced it as a principle of American policy. And uh, that was also, uh, well, the substantiation for this uh, claim was a, a clear division between American principles and European principles. That was a kind of a dialogue uh, because uh, the Monroe Doctrine was a response to the policies of the uh, Holy Alliance. Do you remember what Holy Alliance was? After the Napoleonic Wars, uh, monarchs of the Central and Eastern Europe, Russian, Austrian, and Prussian uh, emperors signed a treaty, this Holy Alliance, to ensure the legit legitimate, the continuation of legitimate uh, power in, in Europe. And they promised to interfere in, against any revolutionary movement that can emerge in, in Europe. And actually, the first uh, example of the Holy Alliance uh, interference was uh, French interference on the uh, prompt from the Holy Alliance into Spanish Revolution. That was a revolution in Spain. French army uh, interfered, well, uh, entered Spain, and uh, suppressed uh, Spanish Revolution. And that was a fear in the uh, American continent because the same Spanish Revolution uh, started also the war for independence in Latin American countries. And so, okay, French will su uh, suppress Spanish Revolution, then Holy Alliance will make a, you know, uh, expedition to, to America to suppress uh, this war for independence. So that was a, uh, how, uh, how the situation was looked from, from some corners of the world at that time. Uh, and uh, what Monroe and his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, uh, wrote in, 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 their, in, in that speech was, okay, uh, you in Europe, you guys, uh, can uh, support legitimate monarchs, you can uh, put legitimacy and uh, monarchy at the top of your political principles, but we here on American continent have very different political, uh, uh, political ideals. And let us develop our democracy, liberty, uh, independence, and, uh, and that will be our uh, hemispheric, they say, uh, the Western hemisphere, our hemispheric political approach. So at that time, Americans uh, juxtapose themselves to whole Europe already, you know. So it's not just Britain, but all the Europe is very different from us. And everything that uh, Europeans like politically is something that we Americans do not like and vice versa. And uh, so that was already in the by 1820s. 
And by the middle or by the end of the 19th century, Russia uh, gradually emerged as a major opposition. Because Russia was uh, the country in Europe which represented or uh, that was an embodiment of the most un-American uh, political ideas in, in Europe. Well, if uh, the United States uh, thought about themselves as a, itself as a uh, republic, Russia was the most despotic monarchy in Europe. If America was a country of freedom, Russia was a country of unfreedom. So sometimes this juxtaposition of these binaries were not just. I mean, if you look at that as a, as a scholar, I would say, well, uh, Russia was not as opposite to America, uh, in fact. Not, 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 not in each uh, binaries. But uh, constructivism worked like that. I mean, for politicians who used Russia as an example of everything un-American, uh, Russia was a major example of, of every, every ideas which Americans did not like. And so um, uh, Russia uh, became this significant other for the United States already by the end of the 19th or maybe early 20th century, well before the Cold War. Of course, Cold War was the peak of this uh, the, uh, relation, but it, it started uh, well before, decades before. And, uh, and you know, for, because it, it was so long used, Russia was so long used as a uh, synonymous for being un-American, you can uh, find, uh, well, in, in American speeches, in American uh, articles and newspapers, you can find the examples when the Russia was used just as a uh, well, synonymous of un-American without, without meaning to refer to the real country some, somewhere. Like you can find a Chicago newspaper with this uh, headline, uh, Russian, uh, poli Russian politics in Chicago. And that was not about Russia or Russian interference, nothing like that. It was about like mayor of Chicago being too authoritarian and his dealing with the uh, administration of the, of the city. And that was just, uh, or, you know, we've seen probably, you, you, yet, you don't yet uh, forgot uh, the story about Trump and Russian interference. Well, we don't know if Russia really uh, supported, well, really helped Trump. But uh, if you followed American media in the first two years of Trump presidency, you saw how Americans will, uh, opposition to Trump called Trump the Russian asset. That Russia, well, some, some people even uh, accused Trump to be blackmailed by, by Putin or by Russia, or Trump being a Russian uh, agent even or if not Asian, but, uh, well, they uh, linked uh, Trump to Russia much more than it, 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 could, be, it could be proved anyway. It was very easy. It, it means that uh, Trump, uh, I mean, that it was very, very easy uh, accepted by American society because, well, we all know that Russia is everything un-American. And Trump is also un-American. So it was easy to, to call Trump Russian asset because Russia, because Trump is as un-American as Russia, because it's very... Very, very easy to think about him as being a Russian asset. I mean, we are now speaking about, I would say, democratic, I mean, democratic leaning, democratic party leaning American, uh, part of American society. Those who anti-Trump, of course. Those who pro-Trump, differently, also differently. So it, it worked like that, that Russia was a major. Somebody, uh, uh, some, sometimes people, people uh, ask, why not China? Why Russia was from the 19th century or from the early 20th century emerged as a significant other and why, what, why not China. There was special uh, discussions about that. And the major explanation was that when American politicians started to speak about Russia as a significant other, they could not speak about China because China was too exotic. You can, you can explain, you could like, be in a political thinker or politician or journalist back in the late 19th century, you, can you could describe Russia uh, using the same political language you describe any European or American country. It's still the same uh, country with a, uh, within the same uh, well, domain of political, uh, political language. But you could not uh, describe China. China was too exotic. China is outside. China was, uh, well, of course, there Orientalization of China was very, very, very much uh, uh, developed. And uh, Americans learned about China not from political scientists, but from anthropologists, ethnographists, philosophers who say adored, Ameri uh, adored Chinese uh, culture, who said, you know, this is Lao Tzu and uh, Con 
Kunzi and Confuci and all of this uh, thousands of years of, of Chinese culture, but nothing about Chinese politics. Chinese politics is just, just very, uh, not was not understandable. So you cannot compare America to China. You can, um, you can compare America to Russia. And uh, those who described Russia uh, used uh, uh, mostly political terms. Those who described uh, China used mo mostly cultural cultural descriptions. Of course, there were people who described Russia as well as from, from cultural uh, point of view. There was a group who called themselves Russophiles, and they translated Turgenev then, uh, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Chekhov, translated into English, published uh, in, in, in the United States, uh, invited uh, Tchaikovsky to, to make uh, American tours. So they were the same people, the same type of people who brought Chinese culture to America. But they were in a minority. Much more Americans used uh, Russia as an example of everything in American political life. And that was an important other because uh, for American understanding of their role in the world, it was very, import uh, very important to call uh, the United States the shining city upon a hill. And that is one of the terms, you know, inherited from the Puritan, uh, uh, Puritan first Puritan uh, leaders of the New England. That was actually pronounced by John Winthrop, uh, the first one of the first uh, governors of New of, of uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, and uh, he he said, well, that actually was a quotation from Bible. He said, we will be the shining city upon a hill and the eyes of all the humankind will be uh, directed to our example. And first it, it meant, of course, uh, religious life, but uh, quite soon it was changed and became the idea, political idea. Well, the, but the idea that the eyes of all humankind are directed to American example continue to be uh, like shared truth among American politicians even now. If you look, uh, just, just uh, now you can Google this uh, phrase, shining city upon a hill, and found that some people in Trump administration, in Biden administration, and some presidents themselves continue to use, we are still the shining city upon a hill. Or, you know, uh, I just, what, what I met, what I, what I last Googled that, uh, who was that? One of the secretaries of state of, of Trump, I think, he said, Russians did not like us because we are the shining city upon a hill and, uh, and they did not like us to be there. So that was a kind of universal explanation. We Americans are shining city upon a hill. And that is from the eight, uh, 16th century until 21st century. And we are on the right side of history. That actually give us uh, the, uh, well, the right to, to behave, uh, to, to, to make policies which we do not like when others repeat. And that is also this. What, what uh, some of the uh, external world would call it uh, hypocrisy or double standard. Why Americans do something and do not uh, like when others repeat it. But from American side, uh, well, point of view, well, it's, it's easy. We're on the right side of history. We can do it. We, uh, but what your, your response is very different. And that is, uh, and that uh, turns us to uh, one, one more uh, idea about the power of discourse, the power of the language. We are getting back at the beginning of, uh, of our conversation today, I mentioned this realist, uh, realistic uh, explanation of, of, of policy. You know, everything is about resources, everything about military might, but uh, you cannot explain everything using just resources. And uh, the discourse, the uh, well, language, uh, accumulated language of, of uh, foreign policy uh, had its own inertia. So if, you, uh, if you're an American politician and you want to make some important political decision, you know, start a war, send, send army, or help like, uh, convince Congress to um, to, to, to spend billions of dollars to economic help to some other country. So all of these big decisions needed to be inserted into the accumulated discourse. You can explain why we're doing that, why it's important for American mission. If you cannot, you fail. You will not get a permission. If you are president, the Congress will not support you. When Woodrow Wilson was unable to convince Congress that League of Nations is a good thing, that American uh, American mission needs to join 
uh, League of Nations, he failed. Congress uh, did not ratify League of Nations, and the United States did not participate in the world order which actually Woodrow Wilson uh, in, uh, designed. So that was important. All, all the time, you need to, to explain why what we are doing is important. And, uh, and we see, uh, well, I, I, I gave you several examples, and all, each of that example was uh, military interference. Well, it's maybe may produce a not not correct uh, impression that uh, the only way to uh, to unite American nation is to make a war against. No, I do not want to say this. Sometimes it works like this, but not always. There are also uh, there are other ways uh, to uh, increase uh, foreign policy, to intensify foreign policy in order to. Uh, to overcome domestic crisis. And that was, uh, I, I'll give you another example. That, one is, that was an example of back from the uh, late 1870s, early 1880s. That was one of the periods of American domestic crisis. I will remind you what happened. You know, that was the end of the Civil War. The Civil War ended in 1865. Then it was a, a period of reconstruction of the South for another 12 or 13 years. And then uh, that was a big crisis because, uh, well, during the elections of 1876, uh, the thousand candidate uh, almost won. In fact, he probably won, but he was thousander. And that was the first time since the Civil War that thousander could become a president. And at the very last moment, uh, the, well, the Electoral Commission stopped announcing the results. You know, that was just one vote in the Electoral College uh, from the winning of the thousand candidate. It was three states which had not by that time announced the results. All three states were in the south. So it should be. And it was, they stopped for two weeks. And uh, finally, they uh, announced that all three states somehow voted for the northern candidate. And the northern candidate became president. And the thousand tilden lost, but the first thing the Northern candidate, uh, Rutherford Hayes, made, he announced the end of Reconstruction. He withdrew federal troops from the South. And that was a moment when the Southern states re-established uh, re the segregation, the white domination, and this Jim Crow, uh, and all of the uh, stuff. So just not, just very short from the re-establishing slavery. <laughs> they could not make slavery back, but they made all of the segregation uh, back and to a large, large extent. So, and it, 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 it was one of the reasons of, uh, of big frustration among Americans. Because, well, we lost almost a million lives during the Civil War. We lost uh, so much resources, and we get to this, uh, we, we finally uh, get uh, this white supremacy back to power in the South. Well, that was combined with uh, uh, widespread uh, rumors about the corruption in the President Grant administration. But it was one of the most corrupt administration in American history. They just sold uh, government contracts and it became known that was. So uh, that was also the time when Grant started the, the biggest uh, Indian wars in American history. That was also the time when, you know, when American army fought the huge battles uh, against uh, white, uh, plain Indians. And some of the battle lost some of the, you know, this General Custer was uh, killed uh, during the uh, battle of one of the battle, battles. Uh, so that was, so that was a moment of, 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 of American uh, identity being challenged. Okay, could we be proud of our country if we have a corrupt government? We, okay, we killed million people to get back this inequality in the South. We, uh, we continue to fight in, against Indians on the plains for, for, for with, with not clear success in the future. So that was a very, very important moment for, for American uh, doubts in their world mission. How we can be the city upon the hill? Who will uh, be jealous to our example if we are so badly organized? And that mo at that moment, what emerged? There were several ideas emerged. Well, one theoretical idea, the th theoretical ideas by, I would say, uh, historian Frederick Turner, who said that, who, who first delivered a lecture and then published a book became, that became very popular, 
that American democracy uh, was born in the West, not in the Eastern states on the Atlantic coast, but on this wilderness on the, uh, where Indians life, uh, live. And uh, on the frontier, he introduced this word frontier and the idea that uh, American democracy is a result of frontier life. And that was uh, one of the ideas. And uh, the ideas is not enough. And that was also actions. And that was, again, why Russia emerged approximately at that time. Uh, in uh, early, uh, in 1890, one, like 10 years after this development, the, all the 80s was a time of, of American doubts in themselves. And then in 1991, uh, there was a uh, news about the huge famine uh, in, in Russia. There was hunger death in Russia. That was one of the, well, we had late in the 20th century even worse famines, but at that time it was one of the, of the worst uh, known to the humankind. So that was a, a big famine in Russia. People, uh, people had no food to, to feed themselves and their families. And uh, suddenly American, uh, well, American politicians, American uh, social uh, leaders, uh, started a campaign to help Russians who, who are dying from, from hunger. Uh, that was the first time when Americans uh, grew, well, gathered tons of uh, food and uh, sent it to Russian, uh, to, to Russian Empire to help Russians to, to survive this famine. And that was a time, probably some of you have uh, seen in the internet or somewhere, these two Ivazovsky's painting, which we emerged actually like, like 10 years ago, and that was in private collection in the United States. There's a uh, ship, a support ship, and the uh, distribution of, of food stuff, where, you know, this Russian troika, Russian carriage with three horses, uh, with uh, uh, bags of, of food stuff, with American flag, and Russian peasants who are staying kneeling and uh, just praying to those who are spread this American food stuff among Russian peasants. That was Ivazovsky helped, uh, Ivazovsky, uh, Ivazovsky sold these paint, paintings in the United States and spent this money to buy more food stuff for Russian famine. But why I'm uh, speaking about that story? Because uh, for American uh, society, that was an, uh, another way to uh, return Americans the uh, trust to their society. You know, if you help somebody, you can feel yourself better. Or you can self you, you you know, helping, not only fighting, not only sending military somewhere uh, can help you to, to, to think about yourself, but also helping somebody. And that also worked. It also worked several times. During the First World War, before Americans entered the war, you know that Americans entered the First World War only in 1917. But from 1914 up to 1917, Americans uh, organized campaign to save uh, Europeans from, from famine, from hunger. There was a huge committee to help Belgium because it was spread, uh, you know, the news was spread that Belgium are you know, dying from hunger. And uh, that was an, uh, and, all of these campaign, campaigns used, uh, you know, the, we were uh, creating the idea that Americans, uh, you know, play in the noble role in the world affairs. And that was a very important thing to overcome the crisis they lived through. All of this, uh, so that is another way uh, to use the foreign, to use the international, uh, international problems to, uh, to ensure American uh, pride of their own nation, to, um, to, to ensure that Americans are still the uh, city upon the hill. The city, uh, still, still Americans are uh, on the right side of history. So that also worked like that. Americans uh, do it in the First World War, and you know that American Relief Administration, ARA, with Hoover, helped the Soviet Russia in the early 20s of the 20th century during the hugest, even biggest, bigger uh, famine of the Soviet, uh, early Soviet time. And well, and Americans sent uh, food stuff even during perestroika when it was not feminine. In fact, in fact, but the idea was the same. Okay, we can help them. We can send the, the food stuff, and that will uh, make us uh, think, think about ourselves better, uh, about ourselves on the better terms. So it worked like that. Uh, and uh, maybe the last uh, historical example I would I would I would say it's from the 1970s. 
It's another crisis. You know, in 1970s, Americans lived through probably, okay, I would not say the biggest, but, but one of the biggest uh, crises in their history. Again, uh, crisis of their trust in their own society. Just imagine yourself being an American, like living in 1975. Uh, and you are getting to inhibit to, to think that uh, America is uh, the most uh, militarily, uh, strong, the strongest militarily uh, country in the world. It has the strongest economy in the world. And it also the model for the rest of humankind because of its political system. So you're American, you live to, you, you grew up with this idea, you, of this trust. And then, just in a couple of years, in several months, you had a big blow on each of these three pillars of your trust. Americans withdraw from Vietnam, and the Northern Vietnam, uh, Northern Vietnamese uh, take over the Southern Vietnamese. So American military, the, the, being the biggest, the, the mightiest, military power in the world lost the Vietnam War to some obscure Northern Vietnam uh, communists. So it was a big blow on the trust to American military. Economically, you know, after this uh, Israeli, Arab, Arab-Israeli war, uh, Yom Kippur, which one was, 73, uh, the organization oil, petroleum uh, exporting countries, OPEC, uh, increased increased uh, the price of the oil four times within a few weeks for every country who support, that supported Israel. And the American economy fell into the big economy, economic crisis. That was a time of, actually, of uh, some of the biggest industries in the United States ceased to exist. It was a time when the big industrial economy of the United States uh, collapsed, almost collapsed. It was the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that economic crisis was uh, uh, triggered by the decision of some, again, of some obscure Arabic countries which no Americans knew about the existence before. You know, that was very, so the hugest economy was dependent on the decision made by oil, oil exporting countries. And that was a second blow. And the third blow on the, uh, the trust to American uh, political system was, of course, Watergate. You know, American President Richard Nixon resigned on the imminent impeachment uh, that should, should follow in 1974. So three blows in a while, I mean, within a very short period of time. So you are American in the middle. You are, you are Jimmy Carter, who became president in 1976. And you need to do something. What to do? Your major uh, task, your major problem is how to return Americans' trust to themselves. And again, for any American president, for any American politicians, to return trust is very important. And that is why uh, Ronald Reagan and Trump later used the idea, make America great again. Why it's so appealing to Americans? Because Americans uh, want to, to, to think about their country as a, uh, as, as a world model. So Jimmy Carter. And what Jimmy Carter uh, can do with that? And it still is the middle of the Cold War. Still, there is a Soviet Union which emerged as a country which is, uh, well, uh, Soviet propaganda, of course, could say, you see that uh, communism is uh, on the march, Vietnam is ours. Uh, economically, well, we, uh, the Soviet Union in the 70s just started to, to sell oil, so that was a growth, economic growth. So everything was better than in the United States. Why you should go to, uh, for American example? So what Jimmy Carter decided, and not himself, we now, we now know because there is a publication of the White uh, House uh, conversations. And uh, it was not Carter himself, but his uh, national security advisor, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Zbigniew Brzezinski advised, you know, it's not, not direct quotation, but the idea like that. Okay, look around. What do we have, we Americans, do, do we have to, to be proud of by the 70s? We cannot be proud of political system. We cannot be proud of economy or military. What else? We can be proud that we finally overcame the segregation. Finally, these two decades of the uh, civil rights movements, we adopted a series of legislation. We adopted new laws. We uh, change the situation in the South. We no more we have a segregation of African Americans anywhere in the United States. And this is a big victory for us. So we can be proud of that. So in the 
and just uh, advice of Kissinger, just uh, project this idea to the Soviet-American relations. And Carter did. And Carter suddenly, for for, for a Soviet uh, counterpart, he suddenly uh, turned to the situation of human rights in the Soviet Union. And it was a surprise for Brezhnev, for, I mean, for people uh, in, in, in Moscow, because, well, we, uh, we just got a, a detente. We get so many good uh, treaties signed with Richard Nixon. We had a, uh, you know, uh, we had a uh, Soyuz Apollo space research together. We had several treaties uh, to limit uh, nuclear arms. We had uh, uh, European, finally, we uh, signed a treaty in Helsinki on the you know, li limitation of the post-war borders and, uh, and economic cooperation. And what, what for? Why American uh, government started to, to, to demand uh, Soviet Union to, uh, to, to, to free uh, the political prisoners and was quite started to speak about political about the human rights but it was because in that uh, in that particular field in that uh, discursive field Americans could be uh, on the upper side Americans could say that we are better than the Soviet Union they could not say I mean, Carter could not say to Americans that we are better in economy because they do not well they, indeed America was better in economically than the Soviet Union but it was not convincing to Americans who just lived through the huge economic crisis but he can say but finally we are better we are uh, better with the human rights we had just overcame the civil rights uh, inequality uh, in the South no American politicians used this I would say discursive weapon against the Soviet Union like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Because, well, how you can criticize the Soviet uh, political, uh, well, the Soviet um, absence of the human rights if you have segregation in the South? That uh, old, uh, I would say, not joke, the real propaganda uh, slogan that uh, you are lynching ne Negroes in the South, you know. А вы, а на юге негров линчуют. То есть это, that was uh, indeed, the, 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 indeed the problem for, for, for Americans. And that was a real problem for federal government because uh, it's a foreign policy. Because uh, when in the 1960 and a uh, few years after 1960, African countries became independent, that was a, a dissolution of the colonial, European colonial empires. That was a problem because the African, new, newly independent African countries looked at America and say how we can uh, join American dominated Western uh, world if. African Americans in the United States are segregated. We are Africans. How we can do so that? Was, actually, uh, that was one of the big factors for federal government to support this desegregation in the 60s. But now, by the late 70s, American uh, president can say, "Okay, we are better than the Soviet Union. We are have a, we do not have problems with uh, human rights, but they do have." And that was a uh, that was not a way to not so much. I would say not so much a way to change the Soviet Union. It was much more important to keep Americans, uh, Americans American trust in, the, in their own society, in the uh, superiority of their own society compared to the, to the major competitor to the Soviet, Soviet Union. And so that, uh, so uh, this foreign policy comparisons, uh, the bottom line of what I, I was trying to, to, to tell you in this lecture, the bottom line that uh, for uh, American politicians, the foreign policy usually is a major tool to keep domestic uh, unity, domestic trust, domestic uh, trust to their own uh, society as being superior. And uh, there are different ways to project this agenda abroad from the military interference to help like famine help or whatever, humanitarian help to, 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 uh, to different regions of the world, and to discursive use of, uh, like during this Brzezinski Carter idea, discursive uh, use of, of, of the better uh, part of, of um, American society in comparison to, to other countries. So that, is, uh, that works uh, usually, that usually works, and it actually differs America from, from other countries. When you try to uh, apply the same explanation to, let's say, to Russia or to, it will not work as, as, as so, so good. 
Well, at some some of the we can uh, try to, to to apply this constructivist approach to Russia, but it will not work the same way, because there are much more identity based on history, and you can you can see how much uh, current Russian regime is uh, deep into history. They are using this history textbook, history uh, explanations, lectures about history, which should explain everything they are doing right now. So they are very deep into history. While Americans cannot do it, and they are not deep into history, they are much deeper into foreign uh, foreign affairs, into into American role in the world, and that is uh, that that makes American uh, American case special. So now probably I will stay, <laughs> uh, stop, and uh, okay, and we'll be glad to to answer your comments or questions. <laughs>